so we're going to start. Um, so this morning we're starting by let's recap where we've been. Uh, yesterday we were asked by the speaker's office to try to come up with short-term emergency proposals that would address the health care needs of Vermonters in the, in the midst of the situation we're in with COVID-19. So particularly looking at issues of health care around home health, mental health, and related issues. Um, we had the good fortune to be working with a group of stakeholders in the room yesterday who very actively uh, on our behalf and with the committees, with some conversation with the committee, uh, came back with a list of specific proposals. Uh, you haven't seen it, I mean, it says all my notes all over it, but I don't know how to reference the document other than it's, it's, been, post, it's been posted. It's been posted yesterday. Yeah. But um, this issues. Talking about emergency, possible emergency statutory measures, looking how to sustain the the care the care network workforce, uh, and issues around uh, and the recommendations for issues also around compliance and insurance or consumer um, Medicaid recommendations. Our legislative council, who is work. Very, very, very late through the night to try to put this in a form that we could possibly consider it. Um, and that's what we're going to look at now. So Jim's going to walk us through. I should say that I took the liberty because we don't know what we don't know what form this may be used in today. One thought was some of this might be amended to something. Um, I took the liberty to ask. Jen to include in that amendment <coughs> our, our telehealth bill, which we've already sent to the Senate, our workforce bill, which we have not yet reviewed fully in the committee. We talked about it, at, you know, but we haven't actually approved in the committee, which we will have to do, which we will do later today, regardless at some point. So understand that that's in that amendment as a preliminary thing that's not been approved by the committee. Um, and the nurse, interstate nurse compact, which is coming from the Senate. We were just trying to think, what are, what are some of the essential pieces of, of statutory work that we're doing that is pertinent to the <coughs> situation we're in? Um, we're not going to be reviewing those parts this morning. <coughs> So when you saw that, I'd say, I asked to have that done. But this is, we're looking at you know, all kinds of possibilities. So what we're going to do now is to walk through the pieces that respond to this memo and to some of the, a few of the suggestions that Jeff Hartford made around the pharmacy. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield also uh, alerted. Uh, I don't know how broadly that was shared, Sarah, but there was I sent a, it to our committee, but you so, sent So yeah. about the uh, pharmacy refills being uh, authorized, and we can come back to that. Just but there to know that, uh, would you send that to Jen so she has it? Which the, the, what came yes. from Sarah? Okay, maybe I'm okay, I'll send it. You know what you mean. Yeah. You know. Okay, uh, we're also. Well, and just that there are two other pieces that Jen included so that we had it there for discussion that came as a request from inpatient psychiatry. So when you see those, that's the source. You can see that stuff. Okay. Well, I'm going to mention the resolution. Yes. Uh, one of the other suggestions that came out in our discussion yesterday uh, with Brian Chia on the phone was concern for undocumented Vermonters, folks working in Vermont who are undocumented, and the what can we do to um, protect them from fear of seeking health care services in the midst of this situation? And there are limits to what we can do, but we felt like we felt it was imperative to make some type of strong public statement. And it's and we have a recommendation, and Anne is working and taking the lead on a resolution around that, uh, which would be 
uh, possibly introduce today. And Ann can say maybe just. I can give you a, a snippet because we really look, looked into it. A, a, the, the, the president has, on a couple of prior occasions in an emergency, declared um, health facilities as safe zones when it's critical to have folks come in and be tested for the sake of public health. Um, he did it in some hurricane situations and the water, the water crisis for Flint, Flint, Michigan. So this would be a request to please consider this such an instance and, and apply that. And also for the group of people who are legal immigrants but afraid because of the new rule that's about to come out on public health burden, if you burden the system and you're not a citizen, that that, that be delayed implementation um, so that it doesn't affect getting people to come in and, and be tested for public health protection. So that would be what it is and that's being worked on. We'll be able to look at it. So then uh, the Joint Rules Committee is meeting as we speak. Uh, and that's the leadership of the House and the Senate. Uh, I'm told there's probably going to be a chairs meeting called for somewhere between 9 and 9.30. I'm going to leave early to go to that. Lori is going to take the lead on walking us through the review of the amendments. And uh, depending on what might emerge from the Joint Rules Committee, there are announcements from the podium. I'll come back and then I want to make sure everyone, we were going to work through the first hour of the floor this morning. That was our understanding, our plan. Uh, if it's appropriate or necessary for us to be on the floor to hear any announcement from the podium, we'll do that. We also have third reading on uh, price, transparency. price transparency that uh, Representative Rogers has presented yesterday. And as importantly or more importantly, actually, we have second reading on our emergency services bill, which is also something that would become a component, possibly, of something if we did it. Uh, and Mari is presenting that. I looked at the order, and it's kind of late in the orders of the day, um, so that we may come back and do some more work in committee uh, if we believe in the speaker to be off the floor. Um, we have our tiny snippet part of the Commerce Bill. That uh, that's, yeah, that's just that's us. Now it's me. So, uh, yeah, no offense to Commerce, but it's, <laughs> that, one, that one doesn't really require a lot of our attention. So with that, well, first, questions and things. Things are, you know, changing as we as we're doing our work. We're trying to prepare ourselves for different possibilities and what they, what form or action they take, um, will be unknown until we take next steps. But I think we should be prepared. To, we should prepare our amendments as best we can, so that if they're uh, to be used, then they're prepared to be used. So I, I mean, just. I know no one knows yet. One of the possibilities would be that we would not be in the state house next week, right? But that's a possibility. I, didn't, I have no idea what the decision would be made. Yeah, I guess I just, it feels like from everything I've been reading, it seems like there's a lot of evidence that being people in leadership roles being proactive about dispersing gatherings could be a really important thing. So I just, that, that, for whatever it's worth for me to say this here and someone to say it somewhere else, it's I'm going to say that. lots of places. Okay. Like in room 10, they're making that decision right now. Okay. And I, Thank you. I don't think there's anything more we can do yeah. to influence what decisions get made. Understood. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, but Jen, would yep. you begin to walk us through? And there are a couple hard copies. Uh, if people need a hard copy. Yeah, uh, that would be great. Could we go and just just for our purposes to Mike, let's start with you and just go around very quickly who's in the room and your affiliation, so we know who we're working with. We we invite different people to come, not all of them work. Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Wayne Fisher, Orca Media. Lauren Hibbert, director of the Office of Professional Regulation. Mr. James, Department of Vermont Health. Sarah Teachout, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Emily Brown, Department of Financial Regulation. Greg Gustafson, Diva. Susan Gronkowski, MVP. Stephanie Winters, Vermont Medical Society, also representing pediatricians and family physicians. 
David Hurley, I'm Executive Director of the Board of Medical Practice and Director of Hospital Licensing in the Department of Health. Keep going, professional regulation. Thank you, Lord Gaston, the DRM. Uh, hospitals and most of them are Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know if somehow, maybe it's just me, but there seems to be extra background white noise this morning. Yeah. So I will ask people on that end of the room to speak up because it's very good to hear some of you. We have guests on the phone, right? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Um, I think Brian Chena, mm -hmm. State Representative Brian Chena, of our committee is on the phone, and so uh, Commissioner Squirrel from the Department of Health. Thank you. So I'm going to turn to the President of Lori and have you start. Great, Mr. Jennifer Carvey, Legislative Council. So um, this is my attempt to put the ideas that you looked at on a list yesterday into um, draft language, and I don't think any of them are here, but the, a lot of the stakeholders who were talking to you yesterday were incredibly helpful to me in, in uh, coming up with more detail for the language. And I didn't say it, but those very stakeholders are also meeting separately at another meeting and could not join us at 8.30, but we invited others for whom we were drafting, saying, does this, does this work? So we're going to be looking for input, like, is what we put forward here viable. feasible, viable, et cetera. So we'll be looking for input. Yes, and I do not have particular pride of ownership. I think there's a lot in here that could probably be improved upon by people who know more about the subject matter. Can I just, um, I think we have around a lot in this. So I don't know if it would be better, Jen, in your perspective to walk through the emergency pieces once or stop at each one and talk to the respective groups who might be able to provide feedback. What would you like to do? I, I, I'm not sure from a time management standpoint, I'm not sure what makes more sense. I, I mean, I think you know, maybe to the extent that we can fix up each section as we go through it, that's great, although you are missing a lot of the... Right. So we'll come back to the ones that I think so with OPR yeah, and but I, medical practice. And it, we'll watch the time if it yeah, gets I think too much. Could, I at least want you to get through it once. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we start off um, with uh, some legislative intent around, intent around a state of emergency, and you heard from the stakeholders yesterday, uh, the ones who were here, about um, some 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 external things that kick in, or some uh, some, not, whatever, some things that are not tied necessarily to the governor's emergency powers that kick in if a state of emergency is declared. Um, and so this is an attempt to get at that, although in researching one of them, I, I actually don't think it's applicable, so it's not in here. This would say it is the intent of the General Assembly that if the coronavirus disease 2019, which I then refer to as COVID-19, pandemic continues its expected spread in the state of Vermont, the government should exercise the authority granted by 20 BSA section nine to declare a state of emergency based on the all hazards event of the COVID-19 disease related emergency. That's just using some of the language from the emergency powers statute. In addition to the emergency powers granted to the governor by 20 BSA sections 9 and 11 during the state of emergency, such a declaration may initiate opportunities to expand access to necessary health care services. For example, 3 BSA section 129A10, which is in the Secretary of State Office of Professional Regulation statute, allows certain professional licensing boards to issue temporary licenses during a declared state of emergency <coughs> to health care providers who are licensed in good standing in another state to allow them to practice in Vermont for up to 90 days. These temporary licensees will likely be necessary to help provide critical health care services to Vermonters who become afflicted with COVID-19. So the other piece of that that you had heard about was federal telehealth and uh, that Medicare coverage kicks in if there's a state of emergency so that um, it waives the site and the rural um, locations requirements, geographical requirements. I looked into that last night and based on some recently enacted federal legislation, um, that seems that it should be already be in effect. It's based on a federal declaration of emergency, including declaration of public health emergency, which happened on January 31st. Um, so, I, and it doesn't seem to have any connection to whether a state declares a state of emergency. So I did not put that in here, both because it didn't seem um, applicable based on the state emergency declaration, um, and also because it seems that it should already be in place. It seems like it was enacted specifically in part to, to address COVID-19. So it, it, declare, it, it describes the emergency period as kind of being while we're having this emergency and 
for future emergencies. So do you want to stop there and seek necessary clarifications, if there are any? I mean, mostly I'm thinking if, if OPR, OPR thinks I got that language wrong. You got it right. Okay, okay. okay. We're good. Great. Okay, great. One, I got it at least one. All right. Um, <laughs> next we have measures. So I kind of grouped these together somewhat the way the stakeholder document had. I called this measures to support healthcare and human service provider sustainability. One thing I should say up at the very top of the document, it says, House Healthcare Committee, parentheses, and House Human Services proposals regarding COVID-19. Um, House Human Services, some of the members of the committee provided some input while I was next door working with the stakeholders. That has been included in here. I think they're also working on other language. I'm not sure how this is all going to roll out. I just sent it while we were sitting here to the chair and committee assistant there in case they want to take a look since their name is on it. But so you'll see there is some human service provider also given the sort of blurred lines between what is healthcare, what is human services. So, we'll a little bit about okay. so. so all of that said, measures to support healthcare and human service provider sustainability. Um, the first one is some temporary provider tax waiver authority for the Secretary of Human Services. This would authorize the Secretary to waive payment of the assessment imposed by 33 BSA Chapter 19, Subchapter 2, what we call the provider tax, for one or more classes of healthcare providers for all or a prorated portion of fiscal year 2021. I'm not sure if that's the direction you want. There's a couple of different pieces in there, but as far as timing goes, it seems like they get imposed at potentially different times by depending on provider class. Um, and, and while I wasn't sure you would want to go back and the stakeholders did not, were not interested in you going back and recouping anything from um, during the emergency period, uh, I put the prorated language in there so it didn't necessarily cut off that source of funding for all of FY 2021 if that was not necessary. So that's why the language reads the way it does. Um, change. So um, the provider tax can be waived if the following two conditions are met. First, the governor has declared a state of emergency as a result of COVID-19, and you'll see that language repeated a lot in here. That was my effort to get at this temporary authority and have it linked to uh, something. So, so it would automatically go away at the end of a state of emergency. So if the governor has declared a state of, state of emergency as a result of COVID-19 and the waiver is necessary to preserve the ability of the providers to continue offering necessary health care services. How much annually is the provider tax? How much we Oh, I'm collect? looking at either Nolan or Corey on that. It's like a hundred something million hospitals alone. It's significant. It's it's yeah. between one and two hundred million. What is it? Do you know, Nolan? The it's a percent of. It's each group, six provider, six or seven provider classes, and they all are assessed at different rates. Mm -hmm. And some are like nursing homes might be per bed. Uh, Pharmacy is per prescription claim. Prescription where hospitals are six percent of patient revenue. Yeah, six percent of patient. So it's, they're all different. Um, hospitals are just. I have this information. That, no, that's fine. Just the ballpark is helpful. Thank you. Great. Anything more on this? Any comments right now? So I do have a, a clarifying comment. This is James to Department of Vermont Health Access. So under Section 2, we're listing the Secretary of Human Services. When we break out the separate, separate assessments, it always lists the Commissioner of the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we're not going to run into any issues with the existing statutory language. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah I, I can certainly know. change that. We'll check it. Okay. I will plan to change it unless I hear that. I'm sorry. Um, Mike Fisher. Um, uh, I, I believe the provider tax represents about a quarter of Medicaid funding. And given that, I wonder if we'd want to give the right person the authority to waive or postpone. Waive or postpone. Make the, the terminology waive or postpone. postpone. The collection of those money, give them the authority to do either. Okay, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Flexibility, yeah. I, can I clarify something? I'm interpreting this, and just to, to clarify, would it be correct to interpret this that they could say, it's waived for nursing homes, but nobody else, like the one yes, or more that's, classes. Yes, that's what I was doing with classes. Yeah. There are requirements in the federal law about um, provider taxes being per, uh, a 
applied uniformly across a class, yeah. and so I was concerned about allowing them to That's great. pick among providers. And it, it, is the interpretation of necessary to preserve the ability that without the cash flow they would have to shut down these operations? I think that gives some discretion to the commissioner um, to decide. I mean, it may be that their ability to continue long term would be threatened. It may be that their ability that they would shut down short term. I mean, I think it's it's looking at if that is affecting their cash flow needed to respond to this crisis or to keep the hospital or nursing home or whatever open in the future, that would be sufficient authority for the authority. Well, I talked to does it also maybe make sense to give the commissioner authority to maybe change the rate instead of completely waive it? Because if we don't collect mm -hmm. provider tax at all, then we might have a cash flow issue. Okay, okay so ourselves. what about waive, modify, or postpone? Uh, there you are. Uh, sounds like it sounds very easy. I don't know how easy that is. Right. I'm just saying the more but it's an I, I'm not it's saying anything option. about his comment whether yeah. it would provide flexibility or not. But uh, a lot of the this is one of the ones that the legislature would need to give us authority on. There's a few right. others I think that we saw were not. So we yeah. do need the intent and okay. the flexibility. Just not knowing exactly expectation of how easy. It would be. And I don't yeah. want to say out loud what I said to Ann a few minutes ago. Ways and means committee will have one to weigh in on this because they, the revenue, there's serious concerns about revenue for the state as well. So there's going to, I don't know exactly how that works, but we'll, they will want to have a word on this. I think the, the, I get, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about how for the current fiscal year or the current um, provider tax year, I would say it this way, that um, part of the issue is your taxes generally relate to your revenues, but we set them and then they have to pay them. And if the revenues are up, but the provider tax level has been set. Um, so how long into the next, for it's kind of that current situation, I mean, in the, as we do the calculations going forward, that's a different story than them meeting the obligations that are set for them today if their revenue changes. So that gets all be be all your fun work if we've given the authority for you to waive, adjust, or yeah. defer. Yeah. Should it be for FY20 and FY21? Well, that's what I'm getting at. Oh, I, I, I mean, see. I, I'm yeah. getting at, and you mentioned that there's different timelines yeah. for the different. Yeah, I looked I'm at the statutes last night, and it seemed like the, there's a schedule for nursing home ones as opposed to like yeah. one date for hospital ones. Some are quarterly, some are once a year. Why don't you put that in, and it's going to go to waste? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so I'm going to put. I'm going to, at the chair's meeting, try to alert Representative Ansel that this is a piece of one of the things we're looking at. That's people with expertise around this in ways and means are going to need to help craft if we move forward. Okay, that's good. Right. All right, so I'm making some changes to this one just to recap, to also to make it DIVA, to make it waive, modify, or postpone, and to apply it for FY 2020 and 2020. All right. Next is... Um, Agency of Human Services provider payment flexibility. And I did make a lot of these Agency of Human Services, thinking of them as kind of the umbrella agency. But if that is not, if we need to make it a, a department within there, we can yeah, make that change. Um, so this would say, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, the Agency of Human Services may provide payments to providers of health care services, long-term care services and supports, home and community-based services, and child care services in the absence of claims or utilization if a provider's patients or clients are not seeking services due to the COVID-19 pandemic, even if federal matching funds that would otherwise apply are not available, in order to sustain these providers and enable them to continue providing services both during and after the outbreak of COVID-19 in Vermont. So this is this idea of paying them in ways that they wouldn't otherwise get paid in order to keep the doors open and have them exist for, to serve people when, when this is over. Okay. It is a May. And it's a May, so it doesn't affect rent. Right. Okay. Okay. This is Commissioner Squirrel. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. 
Um, please let me know if you can't hear me. We can hear um, I just wanted to note, just for the committee's um, understanding, that the Department of Mental Health uh, currently, through payment reform, has a case rate for all of the designated community mental health agencies. Uh, so what that means is that they are paid a prospective payment on a monthly basis. <clears throat> Um, and that reconciliation for that happens at the end of the year. Uh, so I guess my point is that this model makes CMH really well poised to adjust for substantial decreases in services and utilization across the state already. Um, we can also adjust our valuation model um, at the end as well to adjust for that, which would mitigate um, the impacts of decreased utilization due to COVID-19. So I just wanted to make sure that committee members were aware of that. Great, thank you. <laughs> that fits the next. Yes. Okay, okay. all right. Uh, the next, and I, it's my understanding there's more language coming. Um, some had been provided early this morning, but stakeholders are still working on it. This is a, the idea of um, DIVA providing, allowing DIVA to provide cash advances to Medicaid participating providers. There was some reference to rules about expected claims payments. That's about all I had. So um, this is really just a placeholder. That's why there's a question mark. Yep, we'll come back to the heart. And if it makes sense to DIVA and you want to help blend it, you good with that. Uh, I mean, the only comment is that would definitely not be uh, Medicaid match dollars. It would be state, right. state only state dollars. <laughs> um, Again, I don't know that we need legislative authority to do it, but we could not. It's, a C, it's more of a CMS conversation, okay. and, and it speaks to a point that should be made is a lot of this um, will be colored by what the federal government does in terms of assisting. I, I, just, I would just say there are times in here where I'm going to suggest that we might put language in, even if it does not appear that it's necessary, right. because it begins, it reflects our intent of hopefully that's being reviewed as a possibility. All right. Um, section 5, again, may need more, again, a little bit of information last night, um, but maybe not enough. This is on FQHCs and rural health centers and the <coughs> Medicaid encounter rate. So again, during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, DIVA shall reimburse FQHCs and rural health centers using the alternative payment flexibility Medicaid encounter rate instead of the standard prospective payment system Medicaid encounter rate. That's possible. Uh, can I? What, uh, what is a rural health, or like a rural health center is, I am not familiar it's a with. Different des it's a different federal designation. And beyond that, I'm gonna, it's, I guess I'll, I'll yeah. specifically, like in my county, most of, like many of the. It's not just describing a health center that's in a rural area, it is a specific federal. Right, area. so I'm wondering about like many of our rural counties depend on independent physicians for their rural services. Does this do anything for them? No, because they don't, I don't believe they have an encounter rate. That's a okay. sort of an FQHC and rural health center term of art in the. Um, so if they were to need different Medicaid reimbursement in parallel to FQHCs, what would we need to do to? I don't know if you do it in parallel to FQHCs. This is a very, this is kind of specific in the sense that the obligation to the rural health, not rural, the FQHCs, um, there is, with that designation comes a, um, a guarantee um, of a certain coverage of their expenditures, our current uh, methodology uh, falls in line with that. If their encounters drop, um, then we would, in all likelihood, um, they would have a fiscal situation on their hands, and we could find a way to adjust those rates to match what our obligation to meet their expenses are. So that's what I mean by it's possible. In that case, um, I guess I would. I don't know how many. I don't know how many we're talking about, and I don't know. Uh, our rates right now are at the um, Medicare levels. I mean, I think we'd be we'd be open to a, a looking at rates. Is how I would say it for basically our entire provider community. Um, this FQHC one's kind of specific. It's specific is how that, I would, and I know um, Bill has. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I received. 
you know, but I received uh, after this work had been done last night a request from David Mickenberg on behalf of independent practices uh, suggesting that because of the possible cash flow pressures on them that we might consider including that Blue Cross, as an example, Blue Cross Blue Shield is that uh, to temporarily halt any quote recoveries that are occurring in the process right now, but to, not to re, not to end them, but to temporarily suspend them. Well, I'm just saying what I've received. And Wait, so, temporary suspension. Well, I'm going to just suggest that there's a, there's someone who has been okay. advocating on behalf of independent physicians and made a suggestion. It's not incorporated into this yet, but we can review that and have the right people understand what it is, because I'm not sure I'm representing it accurately. But I will forward this to Nisa and Corey. Um, yeah, and Jen and Sarah. And I'm sorry, it's Sarah, of course. Yeah, right, right. Right. That's why I was doing it. You were at least at Blue Cross, and you're looking at me. Oh, Yeah, right. I uh, will forward this to everybody. So, if you need anything to change on that one, yeah. No, I think, I think that's okay. 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 I mean, we, again, okay. that might be one that we don't need. Right. So that we can't all right, so then we get into a group of sections I've called compliance flexibility. Um, so the first of these um, deals with healthcare and human service provider regulation and uh, allowing waivers and variances. So notwithstanding any provision of the Agency of Human Services administrative rules or standards to the contrary, during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, the Secretary of Human Services may waive or permit variances from the following state rules and standards governing providers of health care services and human services as necessary to prioritize and maximize direct patient care and to allow for continuation of operations with a reduced workforce and with flexible staffing arrangements that are responsive to evolving needs. Um, so things that could be um, wait, have have provisions waived or varied from would be the hospital licensing rule, hospital reporting rule, nursing home licensing and operating rule, home health agency designation and operation regulations, residential care home licensing regulations, <coughs> assisted living residence licensing regulations, home for the terminally ill licensing regulations, standards for adult day services, therapeutic community residences licensing regulations, Choices for care, high, highest manual, and then I just put a catch-all for other rules and standards for which the agency is the adopting authority under the Vermont Administrative Procedures Act to the extent such waivers or variances are permitted under federal law. That's a mouthful. So, no, that's... Lauren and David, any initial comments? I, I think that would be fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> see... Um, from the Board of Medical Practice side, I don't see a real um, right. impact, but mm -hmm. on the hospital licensing, potentially it could be because um, we incorporated the federal standards into our hospital licensing rule, okay. and so there there may be um, situations. There's, as you know, there's huge volumes of rules out there that, right. that may come into play. So that would that would be welcome. Okay, Lauren. Yes, this is fine. Um, I don't have much to add. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I think this is largely on facilities. Okay. Um, so it may be something that somebody wants to let Dale know about. Just one quick comment. This is Sarah Squirrel. I think it was captured in the end. I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing um, that Vermont can't override federal law. Um, so as long as there's understanding and language that um, it still would have to be in compliance with federal law, uh, CMS and Joint Commission. One question, um, and this might be just because it's, it's under the Agency of Human Services, but in one of the earlier items, we talk about provider payment flexibility to child care services. Um, do, would Agency of Human Services also be the responsible party for licensing child care services? That was yeah, we yes, well, I think because DCF would be under them. Um, I think that would make so important okay. to add. Yeah, so let me find out that. what those are. I, was, I, I had the same thought. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think in response to the uh, commissioner's statement, I, I think it would, wouldn't hurt to add language to the top part saying to the extent 
the waivers or variances are permitted under federal law, and then I can just take it out of the end. So maybe I'll just move it, actually. Um, oh, and, and I think when, when we get to it, I, you know, I was sending things, didn't know what was already in the way. It, it's possible that the piece on hospital licensing in conjunction with recognizing we can't overwrite CMS will actually cover for the mental health what are the issues issues are later, and, but we'll hear we and we'll say when we get there. Um, I just, I know Woody made the comment yesterday about like, and I just want to make sure that this covers it, which I think it does. If the, you had brought up, you know, someone who's not quite out of school. Oh, like third or fourth year. Gets called up. Uh, it sounds like this would cover <laughs> that by. So this the, is really looking at, at, I mean, I guess it gives additional flexibility at the end, although it would only be for um, rules and standards for which the Agency of Human Services mm -hmm. is the adopting authority. So. OPR would be outside of that scope. To me, this is um, looking okay. more at um, facility rules around staffing and um, you know administrative responsibilities that take away from direct patient care and things like that. Um, so I think if you want to do something, uh, the, when I was working with the stakeholder group, they weren't quite sure how to put that into place, especially given that it sounds like, at least in other states, they're trying to keep students out of right. the healthcare mm -hmm. settings, not put them in. Um, but we can look at that in the context of some of the well, um, on section that on point, though, I mean, We did discuss yesterday uh, relaxation of license rules for those that are retired. Yep, that's coming so up. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> Two more sections. All right, so this next one is um, Medicaid and health insurer provider credentialing during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19. Diva, oops, I should have a capital A there. Diva uh, shall relax provider credentialing requirements for the Medicaid program, and DFR shall direct health insurers to relax provider credentialing requirements for health insurance plans in order to allow for individual health care providers to deliver services across health care settings as needed to respond to Vermonters' evolving health care needs. So this was supposed to um, the, the idea from the providers or from the stakeholders was to. Um, allow somebody to, to move to lots of different settings to provide the services they're qualified to provide without getting stuck waiting in a waiting period for credentialing from the payers. So I don't know if there's any comments. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this is James, Department of Vermont Health Access. So I think there are a couple of components here that we need to consider. So this language may look a little different than what we talked about yesterday. I think in terms of enrollment with our uh, provider management system currently, we are set up to, if necessary, enroll providers within 24 hours. I think when we use the word shall relax provider credentialing as a phrase, we get into concerns around patient safety and whether or not uh, our enrolling providers then would then meet CMS requirements. And so I think um, to Commissioner Squirrel's point earlier, several of these sections we are going to need to add in that language around CMS. Which makes them permitted under federal law. Exactly. Okay. And we'd be saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Well then uh, we'll just Emily, put that in the lead in. Yeah, that'd be great. <clears throat> Emily Brown, DFR, we don't have any issue with this language. All right. So So I will add that to the lead-in. So it would say during the declared state of emergency, to the extent permitted under federal law. Perfect. All right. Next, we have the retired health care providers for medical practice and OPR. Again, during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, the Board of Medical Practice and the Office of Professional <coughs> Regulation may permit former health care professionals who retired within the past 10 years, we picked 10 years as a place to start, you can make changes to that, who retired within the past 10 years with their license and good standing to return to the health care workforce on a temporary basis to help deliver care in response to COVID-19. The Board of Medical Practice and the Office of Professional Regulation may issue temporary licenses to the former licensees and may impose limitations on the scope of practice of returning health care professionals as the board or office deems appropriate. Okay. 
silences in for consent. Um, well, I, it's important not to see some shaking heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, um, just we have some of our providers that might be um, might be involved to have certificates and not licenses, so license or certificate. Okay, that would be fine. Um, Jen, if you wouldn't mind adding registration as well. Yep. License, Please. certificate, or registration. Okay. Sure. Okay, and we'll do that. Um, and, sorry, yes, sir. What, just a question. I mean, it doesn't say anything about money. Yeah, is and the intent that this is free? With the. I would assume so, but can we put it in? Right, that we're not going to charge. charge the, yes. Yeah. Right. How about, or maybe that we have the authority to waive? And oh. we could set by emergency rule and just make it for I don't, volunteers or maybe some other certain classes. I don't know. Maybe you and I should talk offline. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how many people are going to take us up on this, yeah. so I'm not worried about the cost of operations. I think. Really. Yeah. I think we should just be free personally, but I'm happy to okay. talk about this with you. Right. Okay. You too, chat. Get back to us. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and you're going to potentially put in, and I'll just take out the reference to former licensees because it's too complicated to say the rest of it again. Um, I will say, uh, may issue temporary licensees to these individuals at no charge, and then you can let me know if that changes at your um, Okay, section nine. This is one of the ones that um, mm -hmm. Representative Donnie King had asked to put in um, and that may need either revisions or may be unnecessary depending on uh, input of others. So this is involuntary procedures, documentation and reporting requirements, waiver permitted. Notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, the court or the Department of Mental Health may waive any penalties associated with the treating health care providers Failure to comply with one or more of the documentation and reporting requirements related to involuntary treatment pursuant to 18 BSA Chapter 181. So Sarah, it'd be great to hear. I, I wasn't sure because we were res being responsive, but you know, Jen was also already working on other pieces, whether this is already covered under the uh, you know, hospital as long as it still meets CMS and all that. Um, <clears throat> and or whether DMH, uh, DMH isn't other than designation, I don't know that you actually have penalties. Um, this was a concern, obviously, of, of inpatient providers because of the many specific things they need to do and should do for documentation around, for instance, if the involuntary medication orders, there's a lengthy requirement about weekly reviews, and if they have no staff and they're overwhelmed like the other things we're talking about in this bill the idea would be the authority to to waive some of that but it may be covered under what we've already been discussing or you might not be the right one to waive it so if you could just weigh in on that yeah uh, this is commissioner squirrel i think that it will certainly help um, with the eip rule and um, and we certainly agree with the language as presented as i noted before um, we can't override federal law, um, so we would still have to be aligned with um, CMS and Joint Commission. We have gotten some guidance related to licensing and protection uh, related to how hospitals can manage this um, from a documentation standpoint. Um, so we do have some initial guidance from CMS. Uh, but I do think this would help with the EIP rule. And um, the other thing that I would just know, I did have a question about what the difference was between quarantine and isolation. Oh, um, we haven't gotten that, there yet. Yeah. That's a, that's a later there. piece. Oh. We're, we're just looking on the document that section there's, nine. Yeah, yeah, section nine. That's in section 14 oh, when we get to Sorry. It's OK. OK. Um, so can I ask, Commissioner, do you think it's necessary to add to the extent permitted under federal law, or you just wouldn't try to waive something you weren't allowed to waive under federal law? Well, we wouldn't, but I don't think it would hurt to add it. <laughs> all right, great. Um, all right, then we have next group of sections is what I called access to healthcare services and human services. 
Um, section 10, health insurance plans, Medicaid, COVID-19 treatment, cost sharing prohibited. I'm sum the whole thing up. Um, as used in this section, I used actually the same health insurance plan definition you have in your telehealth bill. Um, so that's any health insurance policy or health benefit plan offered by a health insurer as defined elsewhere in statute, as well as Medicaid. Oh, actually, we don't want Medicaid in this piece. Sorry, so I don't want that one. Um, because we're going to talk specifically about Medicaid in one piece. I don't think it applies. I don't think the first two apply to Medicaid. Uh, although, uh, we'll take a look. Maybe next. Um, and uh, does not include limited benefit coverage. So during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, first health insurance plan shall not impose any co-payment, co-insurance, deductible, or other cost-sharing requirement for healthcare services directly related to COVID-19 treatment or prevention. So this is broader than just the testing. Um, I was just gonna put treatment, but to the extent there becomes available any sort of um, preventive measures uh, that seemed appropriate as well. The second would require, and this is one of Jeff Hockford's recommendations, require health insurance plans to suspend deductible requirements for all prescription drugs and shall impose only the applicable co-payment or co-insurance requirement under the plan. And then I did a carve out here, except to the extent that the uh, deductible suspension would disqualify a high deductible plan from eligibility for a health savings account. So recognizing that you couldn't necessarily, it, that it wouldn't make sense for some people um, to have that. Right. Right. And then third, health insurance plans, and this is where I added in Medicaid because I don't think the first two apply to Medicaid, shall allow their members to refill prescriptions for chronic maintenance medications early to enable the members to maintain a 30-day supply of each prescribed maintenance medication at home. Um, and it, you know, it sounds like now there's 180 day, so maybe you'd want to expand that, but based on the um, this is your custody and VP, we're not at 180 days. Okay, that's just Blue Cross. So 30, okay. and so we, we've, we've already done the early refill. We have that in place. So can I just ask yes. if it makes for? I didn't see one and two, um, the copay or deductible or anything applying to Medicaid, and I didn't see deductible requirements for prescriptions applying to Medicaid, so I only put Medicaid in number three. I could so keep deductible, Medicaid. Deductible, no, you're right. The copay, yes. We have one, two, and three other copays. Right, but, I did, but, but this is for healthcare services directly related, and then it's the deductible is waived for the, so, for the prescriptions. Yeah, so we just got word. We're going to gavel in and gavel out, and then go back at 10, so we can keep okay. moving forward. You won't get to be there. So. Yeah. So for us, up. Outpatient hospital services. Oh, there is. Okay. So what we have already put in place is um, confirming with CMS that we have broad approval to remove that, but I do think it would be applicable to us. And okay. Again, then I'm just going to leave the definition in at the beginning that includes a health insurance plan that includes Medicaid in it and have it all. And then the deductible part is. And, and then the deductible part just isn't applicable. And, you know, yeah. Sorry. I think we should have the word diagnosis in there as well. Oh, treatment, or diagnosis, diagnosis, treatment, yeah, or prevention, good. good. Okay. Does that, does that cover the I, testing? I so, so testing is already sure, so happening, yeah. but yes, sure, it's already yes. Happening. but I think, I mean, I think yes, to, it, to the extent anybody who's covered under this wasn't already doing that, yes, diagnosis would, and diagnosis could be broader as well if there was more involved, so I think it's good. Hopefully, right. it also, hopefully, it would also cover um, flu testing as a an aspect of ruling out COVID. Yeah. Sarah, so Sarah teach out with Blue Cross. Um, we do support emergency measures um, in the state of Vermont. We would prefer to give the Department of Financial Regulation broad authority to do whatever emergency measures they feel are necessary and not try to put it all in statute now, um, recognizing that it's a quickly evolving situation um, and that we would like them to be able to respond with a lot of free sort of <laughs> ability and, and not do everything in statute. Um, I can talk about what Blue Cross has done already um, and what everything that we have done so far applies across <coughs> every one of our covered lives and we would prefer to be able to do things that way because we feel that it's better for the population as a whole. 
see a lot of shaking heads in yeah. that corner. So yeah. is not Liam shaking? Not not as, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Brian, we'll get to you in a moment. Emily Brown, DFR, and we agree with um, Blue Cross's position in giving DFR broad regulatory authority, and as well that will enable us to react to what's happening at the federal level as well as the state level, and like Sarah said, have the flexibility to react quickly rather than be constrained by something that was put in statute. That's so what I was like, like, sorry, oh, sorry. we just let the, let the I just want to make sure I make yeah, a and, yeah, right. and then we'll come back to this side of the state. Yeah, MVP yeah. agrees. Yeah. Agree. I, I, I think I agree with the strong legislative intent okay. to um, to diminish or, or, or um, eliminate any financial barriers to care. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So is there an objection to adding the word diag diagnosis in there? And so if I could speak for them, I think yeah. uh, only in the sense that they would prefer you took a different approach to doing this and gave authority to DFR in this in, in these areas as far as what insurance plans should be doing. Right. Like we did so, the other day with the telehealth. Exactly. Right. So right. would that mean also taking out treatment or prevention? I think it would be taking out the specifics. Yes. I, think it would be I, think, I think you could add those general guidelines, but then not be so prescriptive as to say, you know, what kind of cost share or what kind of solutions. So I would feel more comfortable to have language in there that included those, but yep. completely agree that it be worded in a way that gives yeah. you um, the flexibility. Can you guys think about what that language sure. might look yep. like? Anyone on this side of them? Sorry, what do you well, I was just, I was just thinking about um, this teacher's comment. Couldn't we uh, eliminate this, this, this piece of legislation and just have one final item, that, or just one paragraph that gives broad authority to all the agencies <laughs> that? So I would say um, yes and no to the extent that you are delegating your legislative authority, you need to do so in a reasonably narrow way yeah. that gives direction to But it would be just for branch. a set of time during this, this uh, crisis. But anyway, right. so, I, so I think there's a way to get, I think this proposal is potentially a way to get to more of a middle ground on that with some direction and some parameters, but more flexibility to be responsive. Brian, Brian, I think you were trying to speak. I have, I have a question, for, and I, I think you're, you're addressing it, but I still want to make this question statement, whatever it is. Um, the, when I read that language, it sounded really focused, like if a person has medical issues, they go in, and it's determined that it's COVID-19, things would be covered, but I think my concern would be if you have a respiratory illness right now, you might be afraid to go to the doctor because if it's not COVID-19, you're going to be slammed with lots of bills, especially if you're not working, the person's not working, and like they're, they don't have enough food at home, et cetera. Um, so you, my concern was, was around like making sure the language be broad enough that we, we people go get checked out. And if it's determined they don't have COVID-19, it's, that should be considered a good thing, but I don't think they should get slammed with a medical bill because they don't have the disease for going to the doctor either. Does that make sense? So I don't know. So I think the diagnosis that. language helps, and I think I'm, I'm now turning to DFR to see if if that's the kind of thing that they would consider if we, if we directed more broadly um, to. to have you do limitations on cost sharing around diagnosis if so, you would consider a diagnosis of exclusion to be still a diagnosis? Yeah, so Emily Brown, DFR. So we, uh, DFR just issued a bulletin around testing and which provides the testing at no cost share. Um, so that would include if you went in and you had the test and you weren't positive, it would still be covered at no cost share. What if you went so, in to see if you needed to have the test? and they determined you didn't need to have the test. So I believe how, I and I, I don't want to speak to the provider community and how they're handling it, but I believe a lot of uh, providers are encouraging people to call Correct. Yes. and then talk to their provider about whether they need a test or not. And I believe in the tele, um, the telemedicine language, which will pass, included audio. And I want to make sure I'm 
speaking correctly with that, Jim. Yes, I'm, I'm scrolling. It's in this bill as well, so we can just look at it here. Which would then allow, I believe, the providers to count that as a telehealth visit. Um, so there's the, during a declared state of, oh no, that's the different, that's the different paper. So the language that we gave, one piece was may require a plan to reimburse for services delivered by store and forward. Yeah. But the, right, so the, the whole bill is in here. Yeah. The audio piece, I think, actually is in here. Um, yeah. Commissioner may require a health insurance plan to provide coverage and reimbursement for things delivered by audio only telephone, email, or fax to the same extent as coverage for telemedicine, right. not to exclude 180 days. Right. Are there people going to get tested even if they feel good? Or I think that's up to the providers. So my, as I see it, there's such a shortage of testing, uh, tests available that um, my understanding the providers are being pretty um, conservative in which, yeah, and screening people before using a test. Um, I actually had a question about the phone call piece, which is, and I'm sorry if it was said already, can I mean would would this create the potential that someone would then have a copay for their phone call to their provider? Um, yes, because you allow a copay for telemedicine. And is that some? I would feel concerned. But, but about not if it was in the context of COVID nineteen. Because we're already doing because away. Because that's already that. right. Okay, so some someone would not potentially not call their provider. I don't think so. I, what, I, so I want to get Emily in on this yeah. to, you want to repeat your question? Okay, sorry. Yeah, no, I guess I just, I want to, I, I'm struggling with the language and I just want to make sure that we aren't potentially creating a, a situation where because providers could now get reimbursed for phone calls, then the patient would have a copay for a phone call and would be disincentivized from calling that's, their provider. That's a good question, and um, I think I defer to the providers and the health care, the health insurers on this. I mean, currently, I think a lot of times you can just call your provider and it, it doesn't count as a visit, so that's a good point. That right, that might, so if it now counts That may trigger visit. that that um, response. Uh, Sarah Tito with Blue Cross, so <clears throat> under current um, policy, yes, it would. We are changing our policies rapidly. Yeah. Um, and you should all be aware that there is a weekly meeting that's yep. happening at right, least yeah. weekly or more <laughs> quickly um, with DFR and all of the insurers um, to discuss potential changes to our policies going forward. So let's, let's on this issue, because we got to get yeah. through this, let's you have our intent, um, so if you can come together and craft some language and get with Jen, that would be great, keeping Lucy's concerns in mind, which are concerns. Does that work? Well, if I could just interrupt, just to say, I think it's already been shared that the floor has been postponed till 10, but the request is for everyone to be on the floor at 10. Uh, there will be further the Joint Rules Committee, but what is public at this point, the Joint Rules Committee will be, uh, we will be adjourning at the end of the day today until March 24th. Uh, so, but we are asked to continue our work because some of the work we're doing may need to, in fact, be incorporated into actions we take on the floor today. It's a fluid situation and so some of Many of us are recommending that the calendar be clear to things that do not require a response because we have a full calendar and that the uh, pro tem and the speaker are meeting with the governor as we speak uh, and that the issue of crossover, uh, crossover is being shifted. Uh, we don't have the specifics on that, but we're not going to be under the pressure of crossover for today. Which <laughs> <laughs> is a great concern. So I think they said maybe until midnight tonight. <laughs> yeah, no, um, but I think that's, there may be other announcements, but I think how we proceed through the day. All members are requested to be present through the day. 
we will need a quorum. We will need acts. We will need to be taking actions in committees and on the floor. So this is not a please go home now to members. It's in fact asking members to stay. <coughs> Potentially late. So well, we, we, need, we, 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 we don't know. know. We, don't we, know. Don't, we don't know. It's an evolving situation, uh, but know that we will. The decision has been made to adjourn until March 24th without committees meeting in the interim uh, with the possibility that that could be extended. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's what the decision is at this point. So with that, I think we should continue our work, but we should stop at 5 so that we can be on the floor uh, so that we're not missing any further announcements. Mike. Um, a little bit of higher level statement. This, bill, this draft does a great job of protecting people uh, from Medicaid and commercial, but I don't see anything uninsured. for uninsured. uninsured. <laughs> okay, we'll keep that on the table. Um, Mike, should we delegate that to someone to work on that? Well, I think, so DFR does not have authority over uninsured. We do not. Who has authority over uninsured? We do. Right. Yeah, I mean, you would have to, providers. right, yes, you would have to either have the providers do it at no charge or have the state pay the providers for doing so it. So let no me say one other thing, that, that there are, there's also actions being taken at the federal level around possible sick leave, et cetera. I mean, this is not directly addressing this, but and I understand that there is a series of actions that have been taken by administratively within departments. We're all working hard at the same time. There may be some proposals coming out of, from the administration that address some of our concerns. We should continue to move our proposals forward so that in the event that uh, but, but I was, it was brought to my attention that uh, the emergency management had put out a long email, which I frankly did not see. Uh, it came from our police department, which I do not read everything our police department sends because it's often about weather. And I don't always yeah, need yeah, to read no, that. I, uh, but I think at this point, when they send something, we should at least pay, we should at least see what's there. And apparently, it's a for that he is the point of contact for emergency management, which is important for us to now know. Uh, and there's a long list of things, actions that have already been taken, some of which may have some influence. I have not, I have not chance to review them. Okay, so let's keep the uninsured yeah. up here, but let's make sure we get through this in the next 10 minutes because we'll be coming back. Yeah. To <laughs> Section 11 uh, is on pharmacists and clinical pharmacy and allows for the extension of a prescription for maintenance medication. Uh, I took just a little tiny slice of the OPR bill around um, pharmacists prescribing. Um, I didn't take most of it because almost most of it wasn't relevant here, but this would allow during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, a pharmacist to extend a previous prescription for a maintenance medication for which the patient has no refills remaining or for, for which the authorization for refills has recently expired if it is not feasible to obtain a new prescription or refill authorization from the prescriber. A pharmacist who extends a prescription for maintenance medication pursuant to this section must take all reasonable measures to notify the prescriber of the prescription extension in a timely manner. As used in this section, maintenance medication means prescription drug taken on a regular basis over an extended period of time to treat a chronic or long-term condition. The term does not include a regulated drug, which is controlled substances. So I look to who we are. This, this looks one. good. Okay. Thank you. Great. Section 12, this is something from the Human Services Committee, uh, Older Vermonters Nutrition Services Expanded Capacity, again, during a declared state of emergency as a in Vermont as a result of COVID-19. The Agency of Human Services, in consultation with the area agencies on aging, shall expand the state's capacity to provide nutrition services to those individuals who are eligible for nutrition services under the Older Americans Act and who have critical health issues. And the concern here is about um, people who may come for congregate meals um, and uh, are no longer able to either, they're not happening or the person is concerned because of their health issues about traveling outside of their house um, and making sure that they would then get home delivered meals. That is my understanding of the intent. And we'll talk to human services about this. And we just had a request. So if you're not right at the table and are speaking, if you could just speak up because people on the phone are having a hard time to hear. That would be great. 
Um, section 13, I don't know if it needs more language than just this, long-term care facilities and programs, bed hold days, and during a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, the Agency of Human Services shall reimburse long-term care facilities and programs for bed hold days. This is based on the requirement that the facility hold um, a bed, not put somebody else in it while a patient or resident is in the hospital. Um, and <coughs> this would allow them to get paid for that. Um, I just want to throw out a comment on the last one, not to address it right now. I think it probably is being addressed um, elsewhere, but we should also be thinking of the children as well as older Vermonters if the schools close. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Jen, I don't know if you want to put something in, but yeah. then we can also check with education if they're doing anything. Uh, yeah, check with education and human services. And I know that the state is looking at that. Um, all right, then we have a new standalone section on uh, quarantine, and actually it should probably, if we keep it this way, say quarantine and isolation uh, for COVID-19 as exception to seclusion. Um, so this would say, notwithstanding any provision of statute or rule to the contrary, it shall not be considered the involuntary procedure of seclusion for an involuntary patient in the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health to be placed in quarantine if the patient has been exposed to COVID-19 or in isolation if the patient has tested positive for COVID-19. So in looking a little bit into quarantine stuff last night, quarantine appears to be what you do when somebody has been exposed to an infectious disease but does not has not shown symptoms of it. Um, or has not tested positive for it. Uh, isolation is what you do to contain it once somebody has tested positive. Quick FYI, um, there's been email circulating with Sarah, Disability Rights, Vermont Legal Aid. They get it, this is good. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase to add to the earlier part, which we can do okay. offline, but it's all being Okay. And I, certainly if there are others who know more about infectious disease terminology and that is not right, let me know. I was looking on the CDC's website late at night, so um, All right, then we get into mostly stuff you have done except a few things you haven't. You so I don't think we're gonna continue. Okay. If it's, so telehealth is in here. Yes, there are additional, there's an additional piece in telehealth. There's, okay. Okay, let's go over that one. Okay. And that's what I was gonna do. And other just, bills for yes, so when we come back. Jump to, Thank so. You. This has your H723 that you recently passed, um, for, goes on for several sections, um, but then section 20 would be new. It's telephone, I put it in under telehealth so if people page don't want that, we don't have to put 12, it there. Well, bottom of page 12, top of page 13. This is DIVA, Medicaid, healthcare services delivered by telephone. During a declared state of emergency in Vermont as a result of COVID-19, the Department of Vermont Health Access shall reimburse Medicaid participating providers for health care services delivered to Medicaid beneficiaries by telephone, including mental health services and including other services delivered by providers who may not previously have been included in the department's telephone reimbursement policies, as long as the services provided are clinically appropriate for delivery by telephone. I know this was in part to deal specifically with the concern about, not, about video being required for mental health visits. Um, but I, it sounded like there were also concerns about other providers who are not uh, currently included in DIVA's coverage of telephone services, but who may need it during this time. Should it just say AHS instead of DIVA because some of the reasons sure. are through DMH? Sure. Yeah, works for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, This is Sarah Squirrel, the Commissioner of Mental Health. Um, I think the caveat around mental health covers us, but for emergency evaluations um, and warrants, um, we will be allowing emergency screeners to utilize um, telehealth, um, but those assessments cannot be done just via telephone. Um, so just to clarify that, but I think that's fully covered in the language. Can, can I ask, is that a uh, legal is that a legal requirement or a clinical appropriateness requirement? I'm just wondering if we need to say legally, clinically and legally or something, or if you think that's covered in clinically. I think it's covered. Um, I think we should say clinically and legally. Um, okay. I just think they're moving so quickly. I just yeah. want to make sure that um, 
for those individuals who are at the point of maybe having going involuntarily under the care and custody of the commissioner that we still have um, appropriate measures in place to ensure that they're assessed and arranged. Okay, we'll, we'll look at whether that makes sense Thank you. to add or not. Yes. Now I'm thinking maybe it isn't. Anyway. Julie Tesla, Vermont uh, Care Partners. Um, the feedback I'm getting from field is there may be extenuating circumstances where you can't have eyes on observation or you aren't the availability um, of the, the video. So they, we did want the opportunity to be able to use a direct a phone line. In extenuating circumstances, it's never the first preference. We always would rather have, be able to have some eyes on, but we're concerned. I mean, our, we, don't, we have very few staff on our crisis teams. They're not deep, so if we lose a few due to the virus for whatever reason, then we're going to be doing mutual so can, aid can for I each other, clarify, too. Clarify, are you, are you just speaking in support of the language generally, or is in, in response to the commissioner's statement about the screening? The language, I, for us, gives us the flexibility. We're seeking the, the commissioner's concern. I, I get her concern, but my providers are saying we, we may not be able to always meet that. And so we would like that flexibility because we're, we're very concerned about our staff's abilities at this point and just having staff to do this and, and do the level that we prefer. Right. I, I and, and, and again, if this is um, on specific authorization of the commissioner of DMH, in other words, we're not saying right now you can just start doing it that way, but the, the commissioner has the authority to waive that, then if the commissioner feels it shouldn't be. Um, that, yeah, that would give us the opportunity to keep this dialogue going. And that's what it means, right? It does require, so it says HS shall reimburse the providers for services delivered by telephone um, as long as the services are provided are clinically appropriate for delivery by telephone. Do you think that is sufficient flexibility yes. to say that sounds these words? Right. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure the legally part, frankly, helps. So, because uh, I don't think I think the issue is the clinical appropriateness for involuntary. Right, which the, right. Face -to -face. So the DMA so, still, yeah, still has that decision. Yep. Okay. And right. Damon trying to. Yeah, I don't want to. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but That's one it. really important request on licensing that. Um, hasn't been come up yet. We don't the, the provision about emergency licenses that's in section one that OPR has, we don't have that. And I, I'd like to ask the committee to consider um, allowing me and Jen to, to talk about uh, adapting that to, to the about board. About putting a similar program. Yeah, I actually looked in the board Absolutely. stuff last night yes. for that. Okay, please do. Please. Um, can I just add something as well? A lot of times it says the board shall issue the emergency license, and I just want to make sure that David or I have the authority to issue that license, that we don't have to convene a quorum because we're already dealing with quorum of board. Uh, okay. Okay. So okay. that may be a separate provision, but any place yeah, where it says the yeah. board shall issue, I want to make it really okay, clear. Let's, yes, let's connect because I think it would be good to do sort of a blanket yes. whenever it says board, it may be, for this purpose, it may be. Yes. Uh, director. Okay. Um, right. So I was just I yep. thank you everyone.